that racism could be unlearned, that there was nothing inextricable or genetic about racism. Anything that's learned can be unlearned. And in that context, the whites who were on the police force, the whites who ran the political system, who ran the economic order in the South, they benefited from racism, that's true. But they, or at least the ministers, other whites who did not have a vested interest in that system, could be appealed to. They could be changed. And if their opinions could be changed, then the system could be changed. How do you do that? You don't do it by a blanket condemnation of all the whites who lived in the South. All of them were not racists. Many of the whites themselves were compromised by an unjust and oppressive system. And they were prepared to listen to a reasonable argument which advanced the interests of all people in the community. Consequently, the best strategy in that context is not one where a handful of African Americans physically fight back. Rather, it's showing the ability to take abuse, the ability to stand up courageously to oppose segregation laws, and the willingness to go to jail for a higher moral and political ideal that puts the political system on the spot. It forces the national political system to respond to these demands, and it places greater international pressure on the United States. For all of these reasons, the best tactic was not one of violent direct confrontation. Now that's not saying that African Americans didn't feel the desire to fight back. They didn't feel anger or hurt. They did. But they also felt an overriding purpose. They had been trained to operate with dignity in the face of adversity all their lives. And in doing so, by suffering, by accepting the hot coffee thrown in your face, by accepting the police dogs that were hurled at you, you were able to stand up and say, yes, I am a man, I am a woman, and I have the courage and dignity not to fight back for a higher political purpose. That was infinitely harder than fighting back.